first of all, I want to welcome everybody here. Um, uh, this is a huge honor for me, and I know everybody here is uh, thrilled. I want to welcome you to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. Uh, I'm Van Jones. I'm the CNN political analyst, your moderator, and fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and it is now my pleasure to introduce you to today's special guest, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, in the house, live and in person. Um, I'm going to hit some of this stuff. I'm not going to get to all of it. Uh, incredible uh, leader, uh, icon, NW, uh, uh, NBA Hall of Fame inductee, columnist for Time Magazine, author of this new book, we're gonna talk about a little bit, Writing on the Wall, Searching for a New Equality Beyond Black and White. What a year for that to come out. Definitely gonna talk about that. Uh, the NBA, yeah, you can clap for that if you want to, for sure. Um, the NBA's all-time leading scorer today, right now, forget the rest of them. All-time leading scorer. Um, Six-time uh, champion, uh, writes for the Washington Post, Time Magazine, Time.com, incredible scholar, uh, killed it at the DNC. Did you guys see him at the DNC? Destroyed it. Um, he's got the Skyhook Foundation. He's doing so much stuff and probably maybe not known to everybody, but one of the toughest uh, things to get, he has the presidential Medal of Freedom, which I believe is the highest honor in the United States. So, um, so look, uh, it, first of all, I just want to say it's an honor. I uh, uh, got a chance to see you briefly um, a couple times in my life. It's the first time we're going to have a real conversation, so I'm a little nervous. But um, <laughs> uh, we were talking backstage, and you mentioned, I said, you know, we don't have that many uh, heroes. Uh, we don't have that many legends left. And, uh, and you went directly to who? Uh, directly to Emmett Till. I think um, what happened to, oh, thank you. I was, I was eight years old when Emmett Till got murdered in Mississippi. And I didn't understand what, what happened to him. I, I didn't know why. And I tried a asking my parents about it they did not have the words to explain it to me. And I couldn't understand it. And it just really made me focus my, focus my, uh, my mind on what is this problem that causes somebody to get murdered like that? Mm. And I started paying attention immediately at that moment to what was going on in the civil rights movement. And from 1955 to 1965 was really the, the climax of it. So it was, quite a thing to observe, and it affected me. You know, it, it made me want to see their goals achieved and uh, eliminate Jim Crow. Of course, we've uh, gotten Jim Crow off the, off the books, but the sentiment that uh, motivates people to have something like Jim Crow is still out there, and we still need to deal with it, and yeah. that's, that's, that was well, the genesis for this book. Well, well speaking of Donald Trump, um, I was... <laughs> <laughs> Um, just curious, uh, uh, you know, how you, you know, you're, you are probably the most beloved uh, Muslim in the world, um, certainly the most visible uh, throughout the West, um, and yet we have someone running for office uh, who uh, is telling people, a billion people, you're not welcome in the United States. So when you're eight years old, you, your life is, is changed irrevocably by an act of racial bigotry. Now you're sitting here, and I would argue we're seeing religious bigotry. Uh, how do you make sense of that? Well, I, I think um, Mr. Trump is basically trying to uh, use people's fear and lack of understanding of what's going on for votes. He's, he's translating that into votes by saying what he says and doing what he does. And um, it's, it's, it's pitting uh, Americans against each other. And 
for, for the longest time, Americans came together and realized how to solve problems. And all of a sudden, that, that's not working anymore because of a number of different reasons. But uh, you know, one of the things I see that really disappoints me is the fact that the members of Congress decided that they were going to do everything they could to see that the President of the United States was a failure. Mm -hmm. And why was that? Because he was a black American? I, I, I can't get over that. And um, it bothers me, and I don't like it, and um, I got to say something about it, you know. Well, um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you've been outspoken, and I want to get back to some of the things that you've been outspoken about, but since you, you mentioned needing to speak out, and you mentioned wanting to speak out. We've got some controversy in the news. Um, we have a football quarterback, uh, Colin Kaepernick, who uh, refused to stand up for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, my father's a veteran. Uh, a lot of people uh, felt that was offensive and also anti-patriotic. Uh, you wrote a piece that took a different point of view. Yeah, I did. I, I think that what Colin was doing was trying to attack, trying to attract attention to an issue that is very important to him. Uh, what I saw that he said was he is uh, fed up with the fact that um, too many young black people are, are dying at the hands of police who are uh, reacting to fear and their misunderstanding of the people that they're supposed to protect and serve. And too many of these people are ending up dead for no good reason. And you know, that, that is a very worthy cause. Now, Colin could have picked uh, uh, another place to, to make a statement, but um, he has the power of uh, having so much attention focused on him a as the quarterback for the 49ers. So he used that. Um, and uh, I, I think he's right in line with what uh, Mr. Jefferson said uh, when they were putting the Constitution together that uh, it's important to protect the speech of people who you don't want to hear because freedom of speech really is the basis for what America is about. And even people who say things that you don't like, you have to fight for their right to say that because at some point that's going to be you. Gotcha. So, um, yeah. So, <clears throat> I think there is a big tug of war in the country right now about this idea of patriotism. Uh, you were at the Republican National Convention, I believe, or you watched it on TV? Democratic. Yeah, yeah but you, you were at the DNC. I saw you at the DNC, yeah. but you also watched the RNC. Some of it. Some of it. Some of it. Not so much. <laughs> um, My stomach couldn't take too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, was, I was blessed to be at both the whole time with, with my job. Um, the, uh, <laughs> try to stay employed. Um, <laughs> um, but you uh, were in a situation where you were at the DNC, you got a chance to speak. There was a, I think there's a tug of war in this country over what patriotism even is. The Republicans thought they were being patriotic when they were saying, keep the Muslims out, keep the Mexicans out, um, Obama's no good. The Democrats thought they were being patriotic when they were chanting USA, USA, et cetera. Um, uh, in what way do you think, and, and, but now you're seeing a huge denunciation saying that Cap is anti-patriotic. In what way do you see him as patriotic? And then uh, what do you think about this broader discussion about what patriotism means? Well, I, I think patriotism is about appreciating your country and trying to make it a better place. Mm. That's, that's what we're, we're supposed to be about. Uh, what, what people talk about, the, The common good, I think uh, we all, that's something we all have to work at. And no matter what your political affiliation is, all people here, no matter what their poli uh, political affiliation is, we are fellow citizens. And we have to work together to make these things happen. We can't do it all on our own. It won't all be Democrats or Republicans or conservatives or liberals. It, it's going to be an amalgamation of all of these people coming together on common ground. And the only way that we can get to that common ground is to have a discussion. Uh, the Continental Congress was a pretty raucous affair. I mean, there, there were days when the, uh, the delegation from Massachusetts didn't show up, and uh, the delegation from uh, Georgia was argumentative on s some issue. 
and um, other times they were sending each other hate notes and stuff. Mm. But they got mm -hmm. to a point where... <coughs> mean tweets. Yeah. <laughs> they got to a point where they realized we got to listen to each other because the other side has some valid points. Mm -hmm. And unless we understand that, but that sounds and deal very, with their issues, we're but, not going to get to where we want to get. I mean, that sounds very high-minded, and that's how you know, we were taught it was supposed to be in school. But what you're seeing now is pretty, pretty nasty. Um, and I think about you. Um, I think the last time the country was this divided and this upset was probably in the 1960s. And I think about you, you know, uh, probably being about the same age as Cap, maybe a little bit younger. Um, and there was no precedent. I mean, Cap is standing in precedent. He can follow your example. He can follow Muhammad Ali's example. And you might mention some other examples he's following in. But when you were doing your thing, and you were standing up for these, there was no precedent for what you were doing. What was it that you were re leaning on re and relying on when you took the stands that you took? I was relying on what I'd seen uh, Dr. King do, what Medgar Evers did, um, what the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee did, uh, SNCC, uh, as I was coming up through grade school and high school. I, I saw them, they, they risked their lives. They got on buses and, and rode into the South uh, knowing that they were going to get beaten up and thrown in jail. And they did that so that we could have just the right to vote. Mm -hmm. That's all we were trying to get is the right to vote and be treated as equal citizens. Of course, it's gone a lot further than that. But uh, the courage that they showed um, really uh, is, is, uh. is paramount in what motivated me. When I, when I saw uh, John Lewis at the uh, DNC, they asked me to, to say a few words, and I just remembered back, I remembered seeing them when they were getting ready to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and I knew they were going to get hurt. And I just went back to that time, and I, I choked up. I couldn't talk, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, of what the example uh, I, I saw in those people that uh, took that horrible beating, but it showed the world uh, exactly how ugly Jim Crow was. and. Uh, it motivated people to say, hey, you know, we've had enough of Jim Crow, yeah. and, and I'm so thankful. So because of uh, the, the courage and determination of the people that came before me, um, I, you know, I figured uh, all I can do is just follow in their footsteps and uh, try to do my part when, when I have the chance. Well, it, it's now history repeating itself. Um, you see now you talked about the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, young people taking a stand, trying to do uh, something that would make a difference, make an impact. We don't have the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee anymore, but we do have Black Lives Matter. And we don't have just one Emmett Till. I think this generation feels like it's seeing Emmett Till week after week with these videos. And you know, whereas Emmett Till, it was a shock when the mother let the photograph of the body be printed, I guess, in, in Jet Magazine? Jet Magazine. I Jet. remember. It you remember Jet. seeing that picture? I remember to this seeing day. It. To this it day. One of the most horrible things I ever saw, and I, and I, I want to know why. What, what did he do? And, and you're sitting here now, uh, decades later, and I can see the pain in your face from something that happened one time in 55. You're eight years old. You're seeing one picture. What do you think the impact on a generation of African-American young people who are seeing in their social uh, uh, feeds, on television, scene after scene after scene of African-Americans being killed? I think they, they've got to be horrified, and they've got to wonder uh, how much their lives are worth. And um, I think that that's, that's a, a very unfortunate thing that uh, black Americans have to think like that. But uh, their survival depends on it. And that's, uh, it, it, that shouldn't be. Um, but uh, that is the way things are, and until we train our police differently, uh, we, we can't automatically eliminate all bigots from the police force, but we can train them so that they, d they can overcome their own personal bigotry and shortcomings and become good police officers. That's what we want, and that's what uh, Black Lives Matter, Matter should be all about, yeah. because uh, we, we, we have no other choice. And the police are, are such a, an, an essential part of our democracy. You know, it's funny because people <clears throat> will often say that the Black Lives Matter movement <clears throat> is anti-police. 
I always find that very interesting. They're anti-bad policing. Yeah, exactly. That's what uh, they are. Uh, anti-bad policing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny. I, I grew up in a law enforcement family. My dad was a cop in the military. My uncle just retired from Memphis City Police Force. Um, so I never had that view that police are saints and superheroes. They were just city employees, some good, some bad, some great, some terrible. And this, it was very interesting to me because any human system that doesn't have adequate oversight, that doesn't have checks and balances, will tend toward corruption and abuse. That's why you have meat inspectors. <laughs> it's not because you hate the butchers. <laughs> it's just you know if there's nobody looking, some of these butchers ain't gonna act right. That's why you have building inspectors. You don't hate the construction workers and the architects. You just know somebody has to have some oversight because human beings are human beings. But when you say you want oversight of the police, you are seen as an enemy. Now, you said this statement. You wrote this piece, sticking up in a way. It was very diplomatic. The way you write is beautiful. Nobody can disagree with it. It's so perfect. It's, it's really just amazing <laughs> prose. So at the end, you're nodding, even if you don't mean to be nodding. But you stuck up for, for Cap in a way, um, and you, you, you said that he was a patriot. You know, you have a lot of young people now uh, who have platforms, who have positions where they're in the spotlight, um, as you did. And there must be tremendous pressure on you in those situations not to use your platform to adopt these causes. I'm sure Cap is not going to get uh, the hostess Twinkie uh, a, a business contract uh, this year. Um, t tell us how you work through those pressures in terms of don't do this from people who you care about and who care about you. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, after Dr. King was assassinated, we had a demonstration at UCLA. It was just people who wanted to make a statement standing on Bruin Walk. And it happened my junior year in, um, at UCLA, 1968. And we're all standing there. We stood there for an hour. And I had at least uh, four or five different individuals stop where I was standing and tell me that I was getting the opportunity to play in the NBA and what was I doing in a demonstration about Dr. King's assassination. And they could, they could not, they could, their whole attitude about it was because I was having an opportunity to do well in American life that I needed to know my place and keep my mouth shut and not demonstrate that way. Well, what's wrong with that? I mean, what, what you... What's wrong with it? They, they don't relate to each other. One, <laughs> they're mutually exclusive. But, um, but shouldn't you be grateful? I am grateful. But the fact that I'm grateful does not mean that uh, the, the death of uh, Dr. King was not a, a very horrible thing. Uh, it, it was a murder, and uh, something needed to be done about it, and it had ha been happening for too long in America, and that, that's why we, we pro protested. But uh, people get that, that type of mindset where if anybody has uh, an advantage, they're supposed to be, appreciate that advantage and not rock the boat. And uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, that Colin has to, uh, has to abide by that. He has to do what his conscience dictates, and I think that's why he made the statement he made. You know, it's so interesting. Some people feel that if you um, are able to succeed in society, gratitude means not trying to improve the society. Other people feel that if you've been able to do well, showing your gratitude might demand that you stand up, demand that you say something. And, you know, I think one of your contemporaries, Muhammad Ali, um, was in a similar kind of situation. Absolutely. Now, you did something very um, courageous at the time. Muhammad Ali, a, a black Muslim, at that time a militant black nationalist, refusing, you talk about refusing to stand up, uh, uh, he refused to go fight. And, uh, when he died, everybody said he was the greatest human ever born. But at that time, he was radioactive. <laughs> and you, Jim Brown, and other top, top athletes went and sat with him publicly. Uh, why? 
because that was not you making a decision about your conscience and what you wanted to do. You're now looking at another man making a decision, and why did you decide to go and sit with the other great esteemed Muslim in American life and lore, Muhammad Ali? Well, I, I just had respect for the position that he was taking about the Vietnam War, and he was right. I, I, I knew it. It, it, for me, it was a, it was a no-brainer. I, I, I wanted to be involved in it. I wanted to support him, and uh, what he, what he was standing for. It made absolute sense to me. Now, okay, so we're sitting here all these years later, and you say this so calm. It could not have been an easy decision. There must have you must have had managers, lawyers, agents, yo mama. Somebody did not think this was a great idea. Am I wrong? Yeah, you, you're. you're, at, you're <laughs> no, you, you're not wrong. You're you're right. <laughs> um, that's what I meant to say. And um, I, I had to make a choice then. But uh, for me, uh, it, it, it was a no-brainer. Yeah. I knew that, that he was right, and he was willing to take the hit. He, he's the one that lost the opportunity, the, the financial opportunities, uh, not being able to fight for a couple of years. And uh, he, didn't, he didn't care. He really didn't care. You know, if, if, if having the opportunity to fight meant that he had to uh, show some support for our presence in Vietnam. He was going to just forego that and uh, go his own way. And I, I had ultimate respect for him. <clears throat> well, it's one of the most uh, beautiful photographs in, in, in American history, seeing all of you guys there together. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you two questions, and then we have a bunch of questions from the audience. I'm going to ask you a question about women. I'm going to ask you a question about the Jewish community. Okay. Um, I'm going to start with the Jewish community. Um, you're not Jewish. That's right. <laughs> I noticed this once I got close. Um, and yet, we're talking about the 60s. Everybody, I'm sure, bugs you about the 60s. You probably would love to talk about the 80s and the 90s, but the 60s is such, such an iconic period. Um, your commitment to the Jewish community, to anti-fascist politics, meant that in 1968, you did not go to the Olympics. Is that correct? Right. Help me understand that. Tell that story. This is an amazing story of solidarity between people of different faiths. Well, um, the, the president of the American <coughs> Olympic uh, com Committee was a man named Avery Brundage. And during the 1936 Olympics, he's the one that told uh, Jewish athletes that they could not compete in Berlin because it was going to make uh, Hitler angry. And um, I had a chance to go to the Olympics uh, uh, under his supervision, and I wasn't going anywhere under his supervision. Mm. Uh, that, that was just... um, I, I have to say that um, I just find that extraordinary. Um, I have a son who's a very talented athlete. Uh, he's still three years old, but I, no, I'm just joking, I'm just joking, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. No, he's, he's 12, he's 12. Um, you know, uh, I watch the work he puts in, and his little brother as well, who's eight. They watch the Olympics like, I mean, their eyes were this big, they wouldn't blink till the commercials. Um, they think about the Olympics, they think about the World Cup every single day, every minute of every hour of every day. Uh, they pray, they, and they know they're going. And of course, I know they're going. So I can't imagine them getting to that opportunity and then finding out that somebody in charge was on the wrong side of an issue that doesn't affect them, is decades old and to walk away from that kind of opportunity. Can you, can you get back to your mind? Now you're a legend, you're, at the time, I mean, you were certainly you know, an esteemed athlete, but you're a very young person. This is a huge opportunity. And there'll be other people listening who may be facing these kind of moral dilemmas. How did you, as a young person, work your way through it? For me, it, it was pretty easy. Um, I had a really good summer job where, <laughs> I'm serious. I had a summer job where I was uh, able to make enough money to uh, finish my senior year at UCLA and not be under any financial constraints. 
And that was more important to me because I wanted to graduate from college. That was more important to me than, than going to the Olympics. So um, especially under the circumstances where I had to play for someone like Avery Brundage, uh, who was going to take credit uh, for everything. So uh, it, it, it wasn't a, a tough decision for me. I, I decided uh, I, I was going to fulfill my uh, fulfill my commitment to the job that I had set up, and I did. And um, I graduated on time, <laughs> and that that was uh, yeah, good. that was important. Well. <clears throat> I'm going to go through these questions because I, I know some people didn't come here to, this is my fantasy coming true, not yours. So, uh, um, uh, so somebody says, we're going to go a completely different direction. Uh, who is the greatest Laker of all time? <laughs> it's, it's impossible to know who the greatest Laker is of all time because there have been great Laker players ever since the beginning of the NBA, starting with George Mikan. Got George Mikan, could be maybe Jerry West, maybe Elgin Baylor, maybe Wilt, maybe Magic, maybe James Worthy, maybe me, uh, maybe Gail Goodrich, um, geez, uh, Kobe. Where are you going to start? I, I, I don't even want to. That's why they have sports bars. Okay? <laughs> That's great. You, you go, you order some wings and some brews, and you argue. <laughs> and then you go home, and you, you're never going to resolve it. So <laughs> why even try, you know? Uh, uh, um, what was the most notable thing you learned from John Wooden? I think the, the most important thing, I, I think, was uh, to understand what it means to be prepared. Uh, prepared to do what you have to do uh, to honor your commitments to your team. Um, but for him, it was more than that. It had to do with, with family and, and country. Um, he wanted us to, to be good uh, parents. He wanted us to be uh, good husbands and good citizens. How did he communicate that to you? Uh, he, he used basketball. And I, I don't, you know, I, I went through it every day at practice. I didn't, underst I didn't understand the pyramid. The, the pyramid was, I, for a long time, I thought he was a mason. <laughs> um, you know, I, he, had, he had this pyramid thing. I said, aren't those, those guys with the thing? Uh, uh, but um, it, it really it was motivated by his Christian faith. Uh, and he just wanted us to understand what it meant to, to commit this, to learning something, doing it the right way fundamentally, and being sound about it. And he, he had, uh, I think, uh, a 60% a graduation rate. Which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to fire through these. Someone says, I loved your novel about Mycroft Holmes. What inspired you to write it, and will there be a sequel? Um, yeah, the, uh, the publisher definitely wants a sequel. Uh, I've enjoyed, I started with Sherlock Holmes when I was in grade school watching uh, the Sherlock Holmes Theater on weekends in New York, the uh, old movies with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. Um, then, finally, um, while I was in high school, we read um, The Red-Headed League, and that's when I realized that Sherlock Holmes was not a real person. <laughs> Up to that point, I thought he had, was a real person. And then, uh, my rookie year in the NBA, someone gave me uh, the complete Arthur Conan Doyle stories uh, in two volumes. I took them with me on the road uh, and started reading them uh, early in my, my rookie year in the NBA. And, I just got hooked. It got me into other crime fiction. I went from that to uh, Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and um, Robert Ludlum and John le Carre and people like that. And uh, finally, my manager, Deborah, decided, she said, you know, you're always talking about this stuff. Why don't you write one? And I was like, ah, I don't know. And finally, she got me to do it and um, got me a, a really great person to work with, uh, Anna Waterhouse, my, my co-author. And um, that's how we came about uh, writing Mycroft. You're just a voracious reader. You're a prolific writer. Tell me about your uh, childhood home. Was reading pushed on you? Is it something you just picked up on your own? Uh, I picked up reading because my dad, I would ask my dad questions, and he would give me a book and say, here, check this out. <laughs> and I got tired of asking him, so. <laughs> 
after a while, I, I learned how to do research. Be, you know, before I was in the third grade, I could find things, and I j my curiosity just took me from there. You know, you know, one of your uh, friends has said about you that you really are a teacher uh, and a philosopher that got put in a basketball player's body. Uh, is probably, that, is it's probably true. And, and that's how it worked out. And actually, I, I, I thought I was a baseball player at first. <laughs> That's a pretty big strike zone, sir. Uh, well, I, I should have pitched, but I, I didn't have Randy Johnson as a role model, so <laughs> I never got there. Yeah, very, very good. Well, let, let me, um, just for the people who are, are listening uh, at home, you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Our, de our guest today is Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Y'all can clap one more time <laughs> for that. Um, um, we are discussing uh, how to make uh, America a more unified country. I'm Van Jones. I'm on CNN. I'm also the moderator for today's program. You can hear the Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, and you can also catch up with the uh, program. Uh, we got videos on the club's YouTube channel. So um, a few more questions. Um, to this, you probably get this a lot, and I, I never know how to answer this question. To improve racial relations in America, what practical steps do you recommend that ordinary Americans can take? Um, just getting to know the, the, the people that they encounter. Just, and don't worry about their ethnicity or how much money they make or their sex or anything like that. Just get to know your, your neighbors because uh, America is an incredibly diver diverse place. And um, people from all cultures, all, a, a, a huge, amount of cultures have contributed to American life and um, made, it, uh, made it better. Uh, and, you know, it, this, this is just an ongoing phenomenon, you know. Why do we have uh, chop suey and, and chow mein? That's because of Chinese cooking, and those are American dishes. Those, those didn't start in China. They, that, that was Americans copying Chinese cooking. <laughs> uh, why do we have Thai restaurants all over the country now? Uh, great cuisine. It's now part of uh, the American milieu. It wasn't like that uh, in the 1920s. There were no Thai restaurants here. Uh, there were no pizzerias. You know, it, it just, we, we, we learn from every culture that there is and um, just get to know your neighbor. You know, just get to know the people that live in, in, in your neighborhood and uh, good things happen. And a, a community comes from that. Beautiful. You know, um, yeah. <laughs> You know, I was so surprised and impressed and moved by the passion that you have for gender equality. Um, I don't think people know what a strong stance you've taken on pay, equity, um, tough on men who don't seem to get it. Um, I certainly agree with you, but it's not often that you see men uh, taking it on the way you do, why? It's, it's important, why? and I, I see the, the negative results of it when I look where the majority of the Muslims in the world live and the way they treat women, okay? The Quran says that women should be able to choose their husbands, that they should be able to petition for divorce, uh, that they should be able to inherit and own property, and most importantly, the Quran says that uh, they are partners to men. And if you go into any part of what is called the Muslim world, those rights are not acknowledged. And this is out of the Quran, something that these people who say they are so Islamic, they don't honor this. And they're doing a disservice to their faith and they, they don't acknowledge that issue. It's horrible mm -hmm. and uh, it, it shouldn't be happening. And um, Chauvinism takes a different form here in America, but uh, the glass ceiling where women don't get paid uh, what they should get paid, uh, and it's, it's more difficult for them to advance because uh, they're women. Uh, they get charged because their clothes are different from male clothes, so the, the people at the, at the dry cleaners charge them more money. This is absurd, and um, it's, it's just discrimination, and oh. it needs to stop. Well, listen, that's...
you know, your, your consistency um, from eight years old to now in terms of taking a stand for human dignity, I just think is really remarkable. And, you know, it's moving to me. Uh, and I know it's moving to the people out there. Um, I just, I feel like people um, often wait too late to tell people that you mean something. And, you know, my father passed away in 2008. Um, massive fan of yours. Um, I knew more about you when I was growing up. You, Muhammad Ali, those, those two heroes of his growing up. And uh, you influenced him to take a stand. And he wound up uh, uh, fighting to become a junior high school principal uh, okay. in my home county in Tennessee. They had not had uh, that many African-American junior high school principals. And he took one of the worst schools in the, in the county and turned it into one of the best schools in the state, sticking up for poor black kids. Um, so there are people who you influenced and who you inspired, who then influenced and inspired people. So I just want to say to you, uh, thank you, uh, but, oh, and also welcome. for your continued leadership on questions of faith, gender, all these things. Why do you think that the political leadership uh, in our country uh, doesn't reflect the dignity that you've been showing all night? I think the, the, the political leadership has gotten to the point where all they, are, all they care about is getting reelected. And they, they spend their whole career as a politician trying to get reelected as opposed to trying to do what they can do for their constituents that needs to get done. And that should be their focus. But no, they, they want uh, to curry favor with wealthy people and uh, get the money that they need to, to have an elaborate uh, re-election committee and have the funding that they need to, to be re-elected. I, I think it's a shame that it's, uh, it, it's come to that because uh, the founding fathers and the, uh, the politicians that followed them, they weren't like that. They understood that we had to build this nation and we have to keep building it. We have to keep building the, and reinforcing the structures that uh, guarantee equality and uh, make it possible for everybody to succeed. That's really supposed to be their job. Right. I love it. Um, so since sometimes there's failures with the political elite, uh, we now have this almost kind of celebrity industrial complex, a lot more tweets and clicks and attention for celebrities. Somebody asked a very interesting question. On the spectrum of a Michael Jordan pre-2016, on the one hand, to a Colin, what's the right amount of protest required to raise issues on social injustice? Jeez, I, I think that uh, that's, depends entirely on the individual. Michael was shy about it, and he was more worried about his business life than anything else. And um, uh, here, prior, uh, prior, he just didn't want to be involved. He just wanted to go ahead and, and make a lot of money. Uh, he's done that, and now he's starting to understand that uh, there are other things that he needs to do, and I'm so glad to hear him speaking up. It, it, it's, it's awesome. And it doesn't matter, you know, as they say, better late than never. Absolutely, Michael, and I'm so happy to see him on board. You know, he, he lost his dad to gun violence. You know, his dad got killed uh, driving on the interstate. Um, horrible thing. And so th that issue is important to him. Uh, seeing uh, LeBron, and Chris Paul and Carmelo and uh, Dwayne Wade at the uh, ESPYs, uh, the things that they had to say. And then since in, in just in a couple of weeks since then, uh, Dwayne has lost his, his cousin to gun violence in Chicago. So uh, this is real, this is real stuff. This is not uh, a game. And um, people should understand that, that, that these, these young men are sincere and uh, the problems that, that they address and point out are, are very real things. And let, I'm, I'm so happy to see them uh, get, getting involved. But, but let, let's have the, the, the tough conversation because um, Dwayne's cousin was not killed by a police officer. Uh, cousin wasn't killed by a prison guard. Cousin was probably killed, she was probably killed by another African American. Um, often, uh, if you turn on uh, Fox News, um, did I say something wrong? <laughs> 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 we, we're here in San Francisco, I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
Um, if you turn on Fox News, if you listen to conservative radio, um, they often express real frustration with African-American leaders and African-American spokespersons who get so upset about an African-American dying when a police officer is responsible. And they say, well, why don't you seem to be as upset when it's an African-American killed by another African-American? Now, when they do that, I don't listen to them at all because my view about them is that they're using it to deflect the issue. Uh, they don't seem to be very concerned any other day about what's going on in the black community, but then now they want to use that issue. So I don't listen to them at all, but um, we're all friends here. Um, and I wonder, uh, what do you think is going on in our community such that there is so much violence between and among us? Well, the, it all has to do with um, our history in America. The fact that we were denied access to quality education and uh, economic opportunities put us in a desperate situation. So in the black community, uh, that desperation leads people to commit crime. Now, this isn't a good thing, but this is what happens. Instead of being able to educate themselves and get good jobs and avoid having to deal with the criminal justice system in the way that they do, uh, they, do what the, they take the easiest course, which is crime of, of varying types, crime against uh, the easiest people for them to victimize, which is, are the other black people in their community. This is very unfortunate, but this is part of the human nature that occurs in many black communities. And uh, we have to heal that. And the only way that we can heal that is, to, is through education. The only way that we can do, have any uh, impact on that problem is to have opportunities where black Americans can get jobs and have access to the education that they need for themselves and their children to escape poverty and uh, just the, the powerlessness that, powerlessness that uh, poverty uh, inflicts on you. You know, it's interesting when I was, yeah, good. Um, <clears throat> when I was in my 20s, um, there was a big movement uh, led by uh, African-American men, um, uh, the Million Man March movement. That movement took the violence within the community very seriously. Talked a lot about atonement um, and African-American men taking responsibility to be good fathers, to uh, put down the guns, et cetera, et cetera. That movement came under a lot of heavy fire uh, and was seen as almost a negative movement. Uh, that movement was not welcomed by people at Fox News um, or their equivalents. Now you have the Black Lives Matter movement. They're more concerned with the violence coming from the police. At the end of the day, you have a community crushed sometimes between street violence and unlawful police violence. And whatever movement gets put up, it seems that some people want to tear it down. They don't like the Million Man March. Let's take responsibility for our own. They don't like Black Lives Matter, telling the police to act better. Why is it that whatever African Americans do there seems to be this um, uh, negative reaction. You mentioned even uh, somebody doing something as, as, as radical and destructive and awful as running for president. Uh, and that is seen as almost a treasonous act. How dare this man run for president? Um, can you, I mean, you've been around longer than I have. Can you help me understand how you make sense of this strain of just contempt toward any, op any move for black advance? Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that uh, people in power ha have become accustomed and expect black people to be marginalized. And when they fight that, when, when they resist, and especially when they successfully resist that, they see that as a problem. Um, the, the, the fact that, uh, geez, now we have a black attorney general who's actually gonna come and get on their case about voter suppression. They don't want that. They didn't have to deal with that when people of a different complexion were um, the Attorney General. But now that the Attorney General is, is, is a black American who sees 
a very obvious attempt to suppress the black vote, and he does something about it, this is, uh, this is bad news. Uh, this is unwelcome news. I don't, wouldn't say it's bad news, but it's unwelcome news in certain quarters because uh, all of a sudden now um, it, it's, it's going to be a, a, a different landscape. And um, I, I think that uh, this is something that black Americans have to learn. They have to participate. They can't just sit on the side and, and hope that things get better. They have to run for office. Um, they have to, uh, yeah, they have to vote. They have to educate themselves as to what's going on. They have to go to the city council meeting and uh, demand uh, some accountability from the police chief or the uh, superintendent of schools or whatever, just like the people in Flint did uh, when they got, uh, had their water poisoned. Uh, they, they finally got on top of it. And that's political power that uh, 50 years ago a, a black community did not have. So I, I think th the whole issue of change and the fact that uh, the hands of power are not always seen as white hands sometimes uh, rubs people the wrong way, certain people the wrong way. And uh, I think that's, that's really the phenomenon that you're describing. Well, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll, uh, this next generation will we'll, uh, take it further. Speaking of the next generation, a very different question. Uh, Nick, age 11, why did you go from Milwaukee to play in Los Angeles? Um, I went from Milwaukee to play in Los Angeles because um, the uh, Milwaukee team really didn't seem to have any future at that point, it was 1975, I'd been there for six years, and um, it was time for me to leave. So I, I left and went to Los Angeles and had a lot more fun in the wintertime. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody else wants to know, uh, after you were drafted by the Bucks, did you have any reservations about going to Milwaukee in the first place? Uh, and also, um, how were your six years there for you professionally and personally? Talk a little bit about Milwaukee. Milwaukee was, was a great place. The, the fans were the best in the world. Uh, I can tell you a story. We, we played the Knicks. My, my rookie year, we played the Knicks. Uh, it was only the, the second year of Milwaukee's existence. And we're playing the Knicks. They, they beat us in five games, the last game being in uh, New York City. And uh, our team chartered a, a plane to fly us back to Milwaukee. We got back to Milwaukee. It was 2.30 in the morning. There were about 500 people at the airport at 2.30 2 in the morning, and they were so grateful and happy that, geez, you gave the Knicks a hard time, we're gonna do better next year. Wow. Of course, the next year we won the world championship, but that, that kind of support, <laughs> wow. And, and, and they supported us like that the whole, the whole time I was there. Uh, I, I have no complaints uh, about the, the fans, the people that they treated me so well. Um, I, ju I just didn't like the winter. You know, that, <laughs> yeah. that was about yeah. it. And I, and I thought, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for the winter in Milwaukee. I'm from New York. Uh, <laughs> I'm ready for it. No. You, <laughs> you find out what winter really is when you get in the, in the upper Midwest like that. You, yeah. you find out what ice fishing and all of that stuff. Uh, that's not all bad. It. Yeah. Um, okay, so here, here's another, another question. The audience has a, a bunch of great questions. Here's one. Uh, in the HBO documentary about you called Minority of One, we learned that John Wooden, your coach, actually made a racist comment, and yet you vouched for him and said he's not a racist. So how do you explain that? I think they're talking about my high school coach. Oh. My high school coach made, uh, uh, he used the N-word just to shake me up because I was, I was playing a game where I wasn't, really focused on the game. We were going to play a very good team in Maryland, uh, DeMatha High School. It was a very good team. It, they played right outside of uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, I, I wasn't playing very well. And at halftime, he said, you know, people have stereotypes about the N-word. That's how you're playing. And he, he was just angry that I, I wasn't giving my best effort. And he was trying to push my buttons. He, he was not a racist. But he said the wrong thing at the wrong time. Uh, he shouldn't have done that, but it wasn't f coming from any evil intent on his part. And, you know, we, we got over it. But uh, for a while there, I, I, I was kind of shaken because I, I really respected him a lot, and he often spoke out against racism. 
as just it was stupid. Uh, you have to judge people by the content of their character. That's basically what he was telling me. And then um, he used that word. So, you know, it, it kind of threw me because I, I didn't understand uh, where he was coming from. You know, I didn't know if I could, could trust him. You know, we've had so many breakdowns um, over 400 years. Um, and yet somehow there's this, gen this moral genius in, in black America where it's actually surprising to people that somebody wouldn't stand for the national anthem. Right. Like, some people might be surprised that so many people do if you look at the history. Right. But um, just being you know, factual, what is it? I mean, you could have very, you could be sitting here right now, very bitter, very angry. I was a young person. I was playing my best. I was called this name. Some people go that way, um, and yet most African Americans continually find ways to forgive. I think it has to do with the fact that uh, we have all encountered people of uh, very various races that are absolutely good people. And uh, when, you, when you see that, you, you got to understand that there are good people and bad people in the world, and the, their color or their ethnicity really doesn't control that. Um, good and evil exist in all races, uh, in all types of people, men and women, uh, but, no matter but, where they but, come but from. But isn't it unfair? I mean, I remember um, I was uh, in South Carolina after the, that uh, racist terrorist uh, Dylan Roof went and shot up all those African American churchgoers, those African American parishioners. Um, and they forgave? Within minutes. Within minutes. Uh, I went to that church, uh, one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. Um, the bodies were gone, the blood was gone, but you could see bullet holes in the little crayon, you know, Sunday school pictures of. Jesus and bunny rabbits and just shot all up. And within minutes, we forgive. And yet, when a 9-11 happens, or when uh, someone is a PTSD veteran, sniper, shoots a police officer, something horrible, you don't see that same sense of forgiveness, that same grace. And it bothers me. Sometimes I wonder if our grace is taken for granted. Um, I, I don't think our grace is taken for granted, but I, what I think happens is uh, because of, we've had to deal with it for so long, we do not want to carry that burden of hatred because it destroys your soul and it destroys your ability to be human. If you continue, we would become just like the people riding around in Klan costume and, you know, hypocr hypocrites that indulge in their hatred because of their own uh, human frailties that they don't want to admit that they have. And we don't have to do that. And that, that comes from uh, our, our faith, be it Christian, Muslim, whatever. That's, that's where it begins. And um, that, that's where we come together in this country. And I think it's a great thing. Well, you've been one of the great examples of it, and um, I just hope it's not taken for granted. Uh, a couple more questions. Will the Golden State Warriors win the championship in 2017? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's hard to say. I think um, this, uh, this past season kind of pull the coat, uh, rather pull the covers on small ball. You know, it doesn't always work. So um, <laughs> you got to be able to, to have some variety in there. Uh, well, so, but they have an incredibly talented team, and, and they're fun to watch. Um, I think uh, Stephen Curry reminds me of, of Mighty Mouse. You know, have you ever, <laughs> he's just come, here I come to save the day, and he's shooting <laughs> the ball from... <laughs> <laughs> Almost the complete length of the, of the floor. He, he's, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I've told him, sorry, that basketball fans this past season had the best uh, of everything. The, the NC2A tournament ended on two three-point shots with less than five seconds to go, and the NBA finals ended on one three-point shot with less than two seconds to go. 
that's incredible. You guys had a wonderful year. Uh, it, it can't get any better than that. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in the NBA, which player was your toughest opponent and who was your most effective teammate? Jeez, um, toughest opponent in terms of the guy that guarded me was the guy that played here, uh, Nate Thurman. Yeah. And you know, I, I got to play with Magic and Oscar Robertson. I, I can't make a difference between them. They were both incredible. Uh, difference in style, but the effect of each of them were, you know, they were incredible leaders on the court and made the, the team function uh, smoothly and effectively. Um, I don't think there's anybody uh, that comes close in, in far as uh, people that I played with that uh, were that good. You know, one, one of the great uh, YouTube clips of all time is the first game you played with Magic Johnson, <laughs> yeah. when he wins, when you guys win, and he comes over and like a kid on a pogo stick, just jumps up and down, grabs right. you, is jumping up and down. Like it, uh, afterwards uh, in, the, in the documentary, they say, uh, um, and Kareem told him never to do that again. So, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I didn't say ne never to do that again, but I, I, I had to tell him, uh, I said, look, Ma Magic, we got, we got 81 more games. <laughs> <laughs> if, if we go through that type of emotional <laughs> response after every victory, we won't make it past Christmas. You know? <laughs> that's, that's what it was, that's what I was saying. <laughs> you were just worried about the brother. But I have to, I have to give him credit because, uh, because of him, I, I figured out that uh, it was okay to, to smell the roses and enjoy things as, as I encountered them. And I didn't have to be so serious all the time because uh, <laughs> oh, we're, awesome. we're going to win some games and have some fun. Yeah. And uh, we go to we go to uh, Michigan to play the, the the Pistons and Magic's mother would cook for everybody. Oh my God. <laughs> um, I always had extra room in my bag so I could put some pies and <laughs> collard greens and fried chicken and oh, it was, it was wonderful. That's great. Um, Free throws, who wins a game of horse, you or President Obama? Um, I don't know, I, that, that'd be good, that'd be interesting. He can play a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh. I don't know. I, it's, good. He, it's he doesn't want to get the Secret Service mad at him. Um, uh, so somebody says, is religion interfering too much with our lives? What do you think of a world without religion? And what do you think about the richest country in the world with no free education for its children? Um, let's just start, start with the first two, though. Is, what do you think of a world without religion? Can, can we have too much religion? Is it interfering too much? I think, I think we have to have some understanding of right and wrong, uh, no matter what the platform for it is. We have to understand what's right and wrong. Uh, we can't uh, just leave that to happenstance. Uh, it's something that we have to teach our children and um, our children's children that uh, Right and wrong exist for a reason, and um, you, you better know something about it. Um, after that, uh, I don't care what it is. Uh, whatever your platform is, if you understand the difference between right and wrong, um, you and I can get along. And yeah. that, that's, I think that's what's important. Good. You know, it's funny. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a person of faith. I grew, I grew up in the rural south in Tennessee. Um, and when I moved to the coasts, uh, where I grew up, you know, being a, a, a good Christian, that was like the highest praise, you know, that meant you were, you know, you, you know, paid your taxes and flossed at night. I mean, that was, <laughs> you know, um, and then you get to the coast and, you know, being a Christian is considered a very negative thing by some of the, you know, secular elites. Um, and I think there is a view that only very gauche, uh, superstitious, silly people um, are people of faith. Um, and I wonder, you know, given you, that you are clearly uh, erudite and all these things, but also a man of, of tremendous faith, what do you think about this growing secular challenge to religiosity? Um, more and more people saying that they either are not religious or um, are spiritual but not religious. Um, how, how, how do you make sense of all that? Well, I, I don't uh, try to judge people on how they approach right and wrong. 
I just try to get an understanding if they understand what right and wrong is all about. That to me is the criteria. I don't, I don't care how they base it. Uh, you know, if you're an atheist, then you have an understanding of right and wrong. Um, you know, we can, we can get along and uh, we can be friends. I think that's really the, the, the crucial part of it. Um, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're coming near the end. I have so many more questions. Um, but one that strikes me uh, is interesting. You know, again, we lost uh, Muhammad Ali uh, this year. Uh, Kerry Washington said that it was offensive to her for some people to say that Muhammad Ali had transcended race. Um, in her view, his identity as a black man was a positive and should not be diminished. Uh, you're somebody that people often say that about as well. You kind of transcended race. You're, you're bigger than race. You're bigger than black. You're, you're an icon. You're a legend. Uh, your global figure. Um, uh, what, what's the good and bad of those kind of statements about people who reach it to your le to reach uh, your level? Well, I, I think that um, we all are a product of our communities. So you know, I, I was born and raised in Harlem. You know, I'm very proud of that. That's uh, that's what gave me my genesis of of some of the, so many of the things that I love, um, and it also gave me um, an understanding of of the world. So uh, I don't have any problem with that. But uh, in addition to being from Harlem, I'm an American. And that, that's important to me, too. And I'm, I'm glad I'm an American. So uh, I, I think there's room for a lot of different influences on someone, as long as they, they take, take the good and do something good with it. Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think the ultimate freedom is to be able to be all the things that you are. Yeah. Um, you, you're, you're my uh, tallest hero. <laughs> um, by far. Um, uh, Prince, uh, who we lost this year, was probably my, my smallest uh, hero. Um, uh, but he insisted on his freedom to be all the things that he was. Um, he was very religious. He was very sexual. He was very quiet. He was very outrageous. He was, uh, and he insisted that he have that freedom. And by him being so much himself, he licensed everybody else to be themselves. You go to a Prince concert, you have the rockers and the hip hoppers and the old folks, the young folks, the gay kids, the straight kids. There's something about being able to be authentically yourself that is not just freeing to you, but freeing to others. And I think it's interesting to me, the only people who hit those iconic uh, marks are people like you, like Muhammad Ali, who fully embrace your roots. Uh, I think it's hard to grow a tree as tall as you without some roots. So uh, you have a point there. Yeah. Um, two, two more questions. Um, I'll, I'll go fast. They, they scolded me, but I just I, I got to. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, the many uh, WNBA players who are uh, having protests and actions regarding police violence? Uh, the initial response was to find them. Uh, do you think that response would have been handled differently if the race or gender factors were different? Geez, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm glad they did, though. I'm glad the WNBA uh, players uh, got to say what, what they wanted to say. Um, just because they're women doesn't mean that uh, they don't, they're not passionate about issues that concern their lives. So I'm, I'm glad they did what they did. Um, last question. Uh, given the national political climate, uh, what advice would you give to the Muslim American community. There may be a number of people listening or even here in this room uh, who are Muslim American. Uh, the community has become a political football uh, in this election. Um, what words might you have for the Muslim American community? Well, I, I would tell any, any Muslim out there, just uh, give everything that you can give to your country because our, our country needs it. And the fact that you can be open enough to let people understand what you believe in. The more you do that, the more open you are uh, so that people can see that uh, Muslims are not here to, uh, to destroy America. We're, we're here to add to it. When, when they can see that, I think uh, you, we'll, we'll tear down all the confusion and um, uh, misunderstanding that goes back and forth because when they see people like ISIS and all that hatred, uh, this is not Islam. When they go into a Muslim community and see what it's all about and see it's about family and it's about uh, 
learning how to live in harmony with, with everybody else. I think that that's, uh, that, that's where we achieve what we want to achieve here in America. And uh, I'm all for it. And I hope that the, the Muslim community sees that. So many Muslims have uh, volunteered to help uh, our police agencies and uh, the armed forces deal with understanding the, the cultures in, in that, that, that are promoting all this hatred and, and, and barbaric practices uh, like ISIS. And uh, I, I think that really is uh, going to be the, the, uh, the crux of it, uh, just by being open and uh, letting people know who you are. They, they, don't, they don't have to hide. They just have to be themselves. And uh, we'll, we'll overcome uh, the ignorance and um, suspicion that, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of grasped everybody. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar.